Um, and welcome to the New America Foundation. Uh, my name is Andres Martinez. I'm the director here of the Bernard Schwartz Fellows Program. And uh, today is a, is a great moment for our program because we're celebrating Ralph Eubanks' uh, new book, um, The House at the End of the Road. Um, Ralph joined New America as a fellow, I believe it was 2008 or yes, early, it was. Two, late 2008. Um, and he's been uh, great to have as an adjunct fellow um, his day jobs at the Library of Congress. But uh, we have all benefited from his uh, writings and, and thoughts and events uh, with the staff as well um, on this intersection of, of autobiographical narrative and uh, writing so provocatively and refreshingly about how we think about identity and race and how that informs uh, deliberations about public policy, which is kind of our bread and butter here to think tank. And what a momentous day to be having uh, a discussion on this topic, given, given the, uh, what could be a landmark ruling in the Supreme Court. And Dayo Olapati, um, who writes on staff for The Root um, and has been a contributing editor at The New Republic and also writes for The Guardian, will be joining New America as a fellow in September. So this is a, a great event for us that we can take great pride in. And uh, Dayo has agreed to uh, moderate the discussion and... Uh, and be uh, Ralph's inquisitor today. So <laughs> with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to Dayo and, and thank all of you for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Andres, for the introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. The book is great. Um, you know, it's uh, Ralph and I sat down a couple of weeks ago to talk about the book. Um, and what was really striking about it was it was something that was sort of painstakingly researched, which I really, you know, you're, you're, as, as Andre said, your job is at the National Archives, the Library of Congress. Um, and it is something that is sort of a detective story. You have to excavate all of this history, which is your family's, um, and, and also to write sort of a, a story, a narrative that moves things forward. And I, I just really appreciated the treatment. Um, so I guess we'll just talk about a bunch of different things that take place in the book. Um, but the first thing, and I hate to start with the patriarchy, um, <laughs> but I want to hear about your grandfather, who is sort of the, um, the, the again, the patriarch of the, the Richardson family, and just talk a little bit about how he lived, how he met your grandmother, the story of how they came together and, and started this family um, that lives in this book. Um, well, my, my grandfather was, um, my grandparents married around 1914 in South Alabama, in a place called Presswick, Alabama, which is very remote place uh, right off the Tom Bigby River, 50 miles north of Mobile. Uh, the, the cover of the book that you see with the moss-covered road, that's how that road really looks as you're driving down to down there. And my grandparents probably met through um, some of my, my grandfather was a logger. That was one of his, one of his jobs. And his logging companions were largely black. He also had a half-sister who was, who was black. His father had a family, a second family, with a black woman. And he was friends with, peop with the children of that relationship. So they got to, that became part of his social network. And that's how I believe that he met my, my grandmother. And as a means of safety, they lived at the end of a road in South Alabama. Because when you got down to the end of the road, there was nowhere else for you to go. So if you got there, you wanted to cause him harm, you were his. And there was just, you had to deal with him directly. And he wasn't an easy person to deal with. Right. So that's really um, my grandfather. I was also trying to get to know my grandmother as well because, you know, this is early 20th century. Of course, the woman's role is very much shadowed by the man's role. Right. and was trying to learn about her as much as I could and as well. And there are no pictures of her, which and I there, think is too bad. There are no, she there sounded are no, pretty. There are no pictures of her. Everyone still talks about how beautiful she was, even though she has been, you know, she died in 1937. Mm -hmm. So, um, Do you think that your grandfather was someone who was rare? I mean, was he the only man for counties around who was able to, I don't want to say an affinity because that seems sort of reductive, but had a, felt solidarity with black Americans at such an early time? Uh, I'd say that that's what some people in that part of the country would tell you. And I just came back from uh, Alabama, where I was at an event in Mobile, Alabama, where a lot of relatives that I had never met just showed up at this reading I did at the Museum of Mobile. And 
people that I've spoke, I spoke with on my tour talk about how in that part of Alabama there were other interracial mm. families very much like ours. And one woman said, I now feel that I am empowered to talk about them because mm. I felt I could not talk about them before you, you wrote this book. Right. That's really interesting. We should come back to that later. Um, I think um, something else that really struck me about the book is that you're the, sort of this question of passing, because the children of the Richardson family were very light-skinned. And on their birth certificates, they were, um, they were marked as white. And uh, your grandfather, at a couple of different times, was given the opportunity um, to send his children away from him to go and live as white people in the rest of the country. Um, and he refused. So I guess... Um, I'd like to know what you make of that choice. I mean, I don't want to, you know, you make a, a very great case for the sort of richness of having a blended family and, and a mixed history. But because this was so early, because this was 1914, the 20s and 30s, do you think that these children might have been, had a completely different life if they had lived as white people? I think they would have had a completely different life. But I also think that uh, my grandfather recognized how tortured that existence could be mm. that you're the secret. The, yeah, the secret. And you know, what Nella Larson said is that hazardous business of, of passing. Mm. Because you're always um, you're always unsure of when someone is going to find you right. out. Right. Uh, and and something I didn't write about in the book, but I remember when my mother ran across one of her classmates from Tuskegee who was passing. And she really in mm. a in a department store tried to out him. Right. right there in the What's store. What's the protocol? I don't know. Yeah, I guess. but but so it, because it had been so ingrained in her that this was something you didn't do, and why he why he felt so strongly about that. I think he he knew that how what an impact that could have. He, I think he felt that you know his family had been through enough without adding this to it. Right, and your your uncle Edward. Had yeah. two driver's licenses, he had two which dri I thought was really funny. Yes, he had he had two driver's licenses, and he said he used. Um, you ask him, well, which one do you use? He said, whichever one is convenient. Right at the time. Well, I have two passports. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you also make you know an exploration of the whites in the Richardson family who wanted nothing to do with Jim Richardson, your grandfather, and his progeny. Um, and unpacking that and sort of talking to those people um, is a really interesting section of the book, the people who, you know, came to the hospital at the, at the deathbed of the, of the grandfather and wouldn't talk to the rest of the family. Um, but on the other side, and I, I, this is sort of less explored, I'm just curious about Edna, what you could unpack about her experience of sort of justifying her marriage and her lifestyle to black people in the South or other folks um, or even just reconciling the role of being a sort of a landowning woman with light-skinned children who was a powerful person who had a home that had people who worked for her and, and how that got navigated, both of those issues. I yeah, guess. I mean, I think it was, it was probably a tough thing for her to navigate. I think that's probably why she was so generous. That's why people remember her, because she was so generous to people. I have to realize this is during the Depression, so people, they had more than other people had. And the other thing that I haven't really talked about is that my grandfather was a bootlegger. Um, as well, yes. so that's so that's a position of, of power, an additional, a reliable source of income during the Great Cloud. Depression, <laughs> uh, and they, you know, she willingly shared what she had with them, and I and I think made great pains to to make it clear to people that she did not see her status as being above theirs, and that's that's what I discovered through the oral history. What did I? uncover some resentment about her having all of this? Yes, I did. But for the most part, people had let go of that resentment. And, and what I learned from just looking at her that I, I learned about her that I think was the most important thing is that she was just as shrewd as he was, you know, mm -hmm. getting the property in her name mm -hmm. rather than in his name. Because mm -hmm. at the time, she could not have inherited the property mm -hmm. uh, because their their marriage was illegal, right? And the kids couldn't inherit the, things because the, children, the kids were illegitimate. They, the children were illegitimate, so right. they could not inherit the property. So. Right. Um, so one of the things that, as we talk about these sort of these legal classifications and what it is to be a, a legitimate person or what have you under the eyes of the law, it's interesting to me that you have this 
these structures that exist in terms of what our, our law says, and then you have the sort of imagined or constructed idea of, of racial identity um, that work in parallel and sometimes intersect. Um, and I want to talk about this, you know, the one drop idea, um, which is sort of what allows folks to celebrate Barack Obama as our first black president, even though, you know, every time I read it, it's something, you know, biracial or half white or, you know, mulatto in another time would be just as accurate descriptors. Um, so I guess, you know, in your grandparents' time, these labels were very important. Um, and the legal categories were very important, as, you know, you, you unpack. Um, I guess I wanted to read a section that, that sort of talks about how that affected your family. Because uh, all of this is just great, and it, it's just really interesting. Um, the one-drop rule divided the Richardson family and co continues to keep many of those divisions intact. Both families have the same surname and relatives in common. Yet these two sides of the family largely live separate lives and do not think of themselves as one family. They are separate families with the descriptor of black or white, black Richardsons, white Richardsons, prefacing the surname so that you know exactly which Richardsons are being spoken of in a conversation. Um, I guess, could you just unpack, you know, how you negotiated those two families? And it was a generation before where your grandfather had another family that was sort of apart. Um, to what extent does family have to be someone who is has one drop of your blood, right, in the same sense. Yes, I mean, that's, that's something that's very uniquely American, mm -hmm. that, um, that we think of race-defining kinship. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I guess, really going, looking at that, it was a very, um, it was kind of a jarring thing to, I mean, to, to really uncover, because right. you're sitting there with someone, and you can tell that you're actually related. There, there are features that you have in common. There may be physical, uh, physical tics that you have mm. that, that really come up right. as well. And yet they want to, to really not claim that, that kinship with you. That's a very, um, that was a very jarring thing right. for me to run across. But at the, you know, at the same time, you know, you realize that people have moved in a direction where they, they can't accept that. Some of the relatives that I spoke with were having me in their home. They saw that as a mark of progress, but having a real conversation mm -hmm. about the issues that divided us was not what they were not prepared to do. That they made one jump, mm -hmm. but they couldn't make the other one. Right. Um, so, would you say that it's it's blood or circumstance that sort of makes a family? Uh, I think in the in the South at that time it was circumstance, okay. and and I think that. Now it is much more blood. I mean, I, I just look at my at my own family, which is interracial. My my children's you know Korean first cousins, and mm -hmm. so it's so it's a, there's a lot of diversity in the family that we don't really think in terms of these are our Korean cousins, but right. these are our cousins, and that's right. and but at the time when my mother was growing up, though there were those dividing lines. And I guess the other thing I should say that really made this, them choose those dividing lines is Alabama, South Alabama was one of the few places in the country that had three school systems. It had a school system right. for blacks, for whites, for people of mixed race. Right. So they had to have somewhere to go. So that's why I believe my grandfather was so insistent on having them identify as black because this other category left you um, in this in netherworld between. between race. Right. Um, and, and all of the children went to the black schools. They all went to a Rosenwald right. school. Yes. Right. Um, and yet what I found really interesting is that, that um, your mothers, your mother and aunts and uncles called the grandfather Jim, um, which I, I don't know. Could you maybe just explain a little bit what that I think there was just no pretense of formality. In, and they didn't the, know he was white also for they some didn't, time. They didn't know right. he was white for some time. It's just something that wasn't, wasn't talked about among people there very much. And I think it's largely because of the social isolation of the place and, right. and the time right. that had a lot to do with it. When they left that place, I think that's when they started to, to find out that the issues of race were much deeper and broader than there were in that that place where they felt mm -hmm. safe. 
Um, my mother really didn't know that black people could not try on clothes until right. she married and right. moved to the Mississippi Delta. Mm, and and okay. then, then you know, it was, she discovered there was this whole other world that she knew nothing about. Right. Um, I guess I want to talk about that isolation because it is, you know, the title of the book is The House at the End of the Road. Um, and you talk about this sort of this theme of the, the, the distance that this sort of island of a family and of an idea, both between races and um, classes and sort of time in a way. Um, and I, I know that you would probably describe, at one point I think that you describe um, your grandparents as being post-racial in that you say Jim and Edna Richardson moved beyond race almost 100 years ago. Um, I think today we might describe this book and their history as decidedly racial because, and, and even the way you've chosen to write the book, it is dealing with issues of race um, consistently. Um, but the isolation of the house suggests that they were almost sort of extra racial. They decided to sort of leave the whole conversation behind. Um, and I guess maybe I, I'd like to hear you sort of discuss, like, it seems weird to have race be a fixed object and then you can be behind it or in front of it. But, you know, how your grandparents did, dealt with that reality. I think that, you know, I think I mentioned this, that they were really uh, brought up to be citizens of the Richardson family right. rather than um, kind of this broader world. That, I mean, they were Richardsons first and everything else in their identity was secondary. Those things really came later. I, th I think that for my, my mother's racial identity was formed much more when she went to Tuskegee mm -hmm. than it was growing up in right. Prestwick, Alabama. So y yes, it's, race is very much a, a fixture through, throughout the book. And in some ways they lived outside of race, but I think the way that they lived outside of it was, was that isolation by talking about themselves as this unique entity. And that, right. made it, that made a difference. Right. I just want to sort of read, this almost reiterates what you've said, but um, very early in the book, you establish this sort of outsidership. Um, to, mo wise, to most white people in Washington County and some blacks, Jim and Edna Richardson and their children were neither black nor white. They were just known as those Richardsons. Uh, the couple refused the local custom of designating their children as racially mixed, and this speaks to them not, not going to the school. Um, and in spite of the children's racial designation as white on their birth certificates, they also refused to identify themselves as white in spite of their outward appearances. The family existed as an entity unto themselves, living as a black family that moved between the black and white worlds, rather than sealing themselves into the boxes that local people wanted to fit them in. Um, I understand that you know, at such an early time in American history, that might have been the only sort of coping strategy. Um, but on some level, you know, is it a little bit of a, um, you know, I don't want to call it, a, the, the cop-out is the wrong word, but they sort of walled themselves away from the, the fray. Could you talk about an instance in which your family directly encountered racial prejudice or, you know, directly fought a fight that had to do with being one race or another or had to choose? Um, gosh, thinking of a, a, real, a real fight where they had. It's, you know, it's remarkable that they could exist outside of all of this for so long. I think they existed outside of it for so long. I guess the one fight that I could think of, and this is something that comes up a little bit later in the book, is when... Um, my uncle, who enters the, the family business of bootlegging, ends up shooting an FBI right. agent. Right. And I think it's at that moment that he's being hunted down as a black man. Mm -hmm. And I actually mm -hmm. did a FOIA request, looked at the records, and it was clear that they were really looking for a black man. They mentioned that he was the son of a negress, right. is how he, right. he was referred to in the um, FBI reports. And at that moment, I think that's when my grandfather realized that his children, were, that he could not <laughs> protect them right. anymore from this and actually helped him hide out and made a deal through his lawyers with the FBI, making sure that he was not going to be killed. Because a black man shooting a white man in South Alabama in 1952 meant probably that he was going to be killed. Right. So he stayed on the lam for four months while my grandfather, through his attorneys, negotiated a deal for him to be turned over. And I think that's probably the biggest incident. And, I, and it was right after that that my grandfather started deeding his property to his children. 
-hmm. realizing that I don't have much longer. This is all going to get fought out in my family. Let me just deal with this now before I have to right. deal with this whole issue of who's actually family. Right. And, that, and I law. think that really, it was, that was 52, and it was by, I think it was by 54, he started deeding the property. Okay. And, you know, it hit home, the reality, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so something that's interesting, I, you discuss at some point that you would see your, your white relatives without any black blood in it whatsoever, not just white looking, but white relatives, um, a steady stream of fair haired, blue eyed people um, whom, because they looked like your mother um, and your mother is black, you thought were black like her. Um, I think that's a really remarkable inversion, um, you know, this sort of reverse assumption that your default assumption was that, you know, people who look like such and such or who are part of my family are black. Um, I want to know, you know, first of all, how old you were when that was, because I don't know, uh, uh, and, and whether or not, you know, this is a sort of complete, sort of admirable um, colorblindness or, or, or what? I think that it was... My grandfather's race was never talked about. As I, I didn't even really know he was black till I was sixteen. Really didn't. I was not. Did not have an awareness of that. Your grandmother, or your grandfather. Um, I didn't know that my grandfather was okay. was white till I was okay. sixteen. Right. So, it was. It's just something that wasn't really discussed in my family, and and I just was not aware at all. Mm. I didn't have this awareness. I mean, I also grew up very isolated as well. So in a, on an 80-acre farm in South Mississippi in, in the middle of nowhere, which when I go back there, I wonder, how did I get out of here? But it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so there are a lot of similarities between kind of my background and my mother's background. Mm. I mean, my, my parents constructed also a very similar type reality mm -hmm. for me, very isolated from what was going on in the civil rights movement in Mississippi at the time. I was aware of it. The images were on television. They were going on all around me. I knew what was going on, but was it very, did it actually have an impact on my day-to-day -day life? No. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same thing there. It was that I go from one isolated place to another, and it, right. I'm, I'm just completely unaware. See, that's really interesting. So there's a sort of literature of, um, you know, I guess it starts with Dreams from My Father, but there are a host of other books where people are sort of searching for their family, and it's an interracial sort of American story. Um, and yours, I think, is apart from all of these in a certain sense. I'm thinking of um, Helene Cooper's book, The House on Sugar Beach, where she's got, you know, a sister who is sort of adopted into the family who is not of her family and deals with that issue in Liberia. Um, Danzy Senna has written a book about her parents who was, you know, a, a white woman who was from one of the oldest families in America and a, and a black man who was from the Deep South. Um, and even Barack Obama's story, everybody's family falls apart, mm -hmm. except for yours, which I think is very interesting. That... In 1968, when Senna's parents met, 1961, when Barack Obama's parents met, um, and in this other situation, everybody sort of, it was too much to be in the 60s, to be in the fray, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to apart from it. So even though it was 1914, your grandparents' marriage and the family they created sort of, well, the turbulent story is narrated here, really did keep it together. What do you make of that? I think they were able to, to keep it together just for the very reason we were discussing earlier. It was the isolation. Mm, that right. really helped them keep that all together. And I think with, if they had gone outside of that, and I think that's probably one of the things that my grandfather realized, once we get outside of this, it all falls apart. Right. And, that's, and I think that's probably what, what could have happened. Right. That's sort of depressing. Yeah, no. It is really, it is really depressing. <laughs> when, you know, when I think about it now, um, and and I and it, and I think that actually came up with one of the relatives who showed up in um, in Mobile just this last week, um, who was from a family where she said we did, my my mother denied that we that we were related. She said you know, and said they don't know that I'm here, mm -hmm. uh, and right. so there's realizing that that isolation kept us from 
sometimes interacting with those other relatives and, mm -hmm. and really kind of shielding us from them from, and yeah. from some of the hurt. And as my, there were instances, I'm sure, where you know, offense was taken, but they knew they didn't want to offend my grandfather because he, you know, he was pretty quick with the gun. He was very quick tempered. So. Right. Um, so, what was your your favorite part of re researching the book? Um, I know that you know you. We've talked about the process you went through of re of reading and writing about it and talking to different people. Um, what did you enjoy the most? I think I probably uh, enjoyed the most going into the archives in Alabama, looking at all the, the cases of interracial marriage. So looking at a lot of those cases and trying to find some similarities to my grandparents' story, trying to figure out why they were not really um, pr prosecuted. And I think also probably the one thing that had the most profound impact on me was going through my own DNA mm. with uh, geneticist Mark Schreiber at Penn State, who walked me through my DNA, telling me exactly what all the various markers meant, and then showing me the entire human genome and how this all mm. fit in. And you see the part that you know, may bring up certain racial characteristics is so infinitesimal, so mm. insignificant, that it completely deconstructed the, the idea of race for me. Right. Uh, so he left me saying, well, we can figure out where the 6% Asian ancestry comes from if you do a matrilineal DNA test, why don't you think about that on the drive home? And then I, on the drive home, I thought, it doesn't matter to me anymore. Right, really interesting. Um, so you talked also, when we sort of chatted earlier, about how the work of um, Kwame Anthony Appiah sort of influenced your impressions of the stuff that you were reading and, and how you were interpreting the information. Could you talk just a little bit about that? Uh, I spent a lot of time reading um, his you know, ethics of identity, um, reading his chapter, The uh, Illusion of Race, mm -hmm. that's uh, in, my, from in My Father's House, mm -hmm. and um, Cosmopolitanism. Read a lot of his work that I have to read you know, over and over. He's not a very fast read. Right. But the, the big thing that I took away from, from that is that we, the thing that he says is that we ask race to do more for us in this world than it can do. Right. And that was a big thing for me. And then saying, talking about how conversations about race and culture really begin when we have new ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. That's a mm -hmm. big, that's kind of become my mantra. What are the new ways of thinking, feeling, and acting about race that we should be embracing right. in, in our culture? And that's, um, that had a, very profound impact on me. Someone told me when I started this that said this is going to change you. And I thought, how could writing about my family change me? Mm. I didn't think it could really change me, but it it did. It gave me a whole new perspective and made me start to look beyond race. I mean, race is still very much a social reality, and I it's there's no denying that social reality, mm. but it's become much less important to me than it was, I think, when I started. Mm, okay. Um, well, I guess with that, I want to open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, we've had a robust conversation. Anybody? One second. Did, oh, how you did your research, and also, were there what you learned about your family that you hadn't known that was new to you? Uh, well, how I did a lot of the research is I had to start off with doing, doing some oral history because my grandparents, their marriage being illegal, didn't leave a big paper trail. There were some letters between them that my aunt had destroyed that she told me the contents of one of them that told the story of, of building the house. So I went, start first starting to do a lot of oral history, looking in courthouse records in Alabama. Um, going to the archives in Alabama was another another source, and also the the local historical society. There was a point I have to say that I was about to to give up, and I said, if I can't really make progress on this trip, I'm going to call my agent and say I can't do this book because it was hard getting people to talk openly. These are elderly people, keeping the story going. 
And I walked into the archives, and the woman sitting there at the desk, I told her what I was doing. She said, oh, well, we're related. I'm a Richardson. And she pulls out this will. So this is the will of our uh, common ancestor. So it has the slaves that they own. Every, you know, told me a lot about them. And there's this other dimension to it. And the archivist comes out and says, well, who are your grandmother's family? You know, the old, old thing in the South, who are your people? Hmm. So asking me who my people were, and I told him, said, then you're related to you know, Mahala Martin, who was known as Ape Hagar, who was the first African American to own property in this part of Alabama. So you're really, this is, so realizing, gosh, you know, my family has this real um, first family status in this part of Alabama. So I said, that's kind of where I can begin the story. And if I can work from that out, uh, that's how I start decided to do my research. People gave me things along the way. Uh, really driving roads in South Alabama became my research. Any lead I would get, I would go, I would sit on someone's front porch and people would let you in. They'd open the door, sit you down, feed you, talk to you. Recorder going at the same time. So that's really how I did a lot of it. Did anyone say no? Yes, people did say no. Um, there were people who there was an article that was done about the work I was doing by a reporter from the Mobile Register. And a lot of people called me wanting to talk with me on the next visit. By the time I arrived in Alabama, there were people who'd gotten cold feet, who said, I can't talk to you, and actually sent me to someone else to, to talk to me. Uh, and as someone told me, if you'd started, I said, I wish I would have done this 20 years ago when more people were alive. She said, honey, if you'd started this 20 years ago, nobody would have talked to you. <laughs> Just a second. Um, your mother, you said, did your mother go to Tuskegee? Yes, my mother went to Tuskegee. Why did they choose Tuskegee? And then who did she marry in terms of choices of, of race, uh, black or white? Um, <clears throat> my, I think they chose Tuskegee because at the time that would have been kind of the, the premier inst institution for black people in, in Alabama. And it had a great tradition, and I think also that whole practical aspect of it. I think my, my grandfather was a very practical man. I think he saw that uh, aspect. And there was a lot of discipline there, which I have to say my mother really needed. Um, being the youngest child, very, very um, spoiled. Um, and, you know, my father is, is black, my, but if you look at my, as I say, if you take both of my grandparents and put them side by side, you don't know which one is black and which one is white. Both of them have blonde hair and blue eyes. But my Grandmother on my, my paternal grandmother identified as, as black, but was from a relationship that we, we don't know who we're related to from that because her, great, her, great, her mother was a slave. So it, it really changes the whole dimension there. So my, my grandfather, my father identified as being black. That's the only thing that he knew, which is why my grandfather's picture stayed in a closet for so many years. Uh, he said the hardest thing he ever did was ask a white man to marry his daughter. That's what he had to do in 1952. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if you have children, but uh, how have you or how would you talk to your kids about your family's complex history and how it relates to racial politics, racial history, and identity in this country? Um, we have talked about that a, a, a great deal. Uh, they went with me on the, the first trip when I started um, doing research on this, and you know, we talked a great deal about the history. They identify as being multiracial, and my daughter did one of the last interviews I did with a relative who's, who was in her 90s, and we were talking about all these issues of race, and my daughter says, I don't know why this is all such a big deal. So the perspective of her generation is, is so very different than my generation. And I think that's where the issue of, of racial politics, how that will, will play out, is going to be in the next generation. It's going to be very, I think we're, my generation is keeping a lot of that going because we haven't embraced the new ways of thinking, feeling, and acting. But they will. Uh, if. You know, if we do if we do it right, they will. I should say. 
Hi. <laughs> um, re sort of related to that question, I'm curious. Um, I mean, obviously, you don't live on a on a big farm somewhere in the middle of nowhere anymore. But um, I'm curious as to whether you feel that in any way you have tried to kind of recreate isolation in some sense for your kids, which seems to be sort of this common thread that Dio was was pointing to throughout your family. If there's some uh, some type of way in which you've tried to insulate your, your children from these issues? Uh, I don't think they've been insulated from the issues, but they have had, I mean, we, I mean, we purposely live in, in a city where it's going to be accepted for them to be multiracial rather than, say, living in the South. I've had opportunities to return to the South, and that's always been a, a real sticking point is what impact would that have on, on them? So yes, I think in a lot of ways I have created a very similar um, you know, sense of isolation, but in a much broader world where, but where things are discussed much more openly than they would have been for my mother or even in my own family growing up where you know, we didn't talk about what my grandfather's race was because at the time growing up in Mississippi, you know, this is what I know from my first book on the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, claiming that kinship would have led to other questions and other, um, and could have led to violence against the, the family as well. So, uh, but yes, I have created some of that sense of, sense of isolation and security for them, while at the same time uh, letting them to see things much more broadly. I just remember my, my oldest son saying at one point that he saw himself more as a citizen of the world. And that may be something that, that has come through schools a lot more now, so rather than an American as a citizen of the world. And that's a very different viewpoint than I grew up with. I also think it's really interesting that you speak of cities as being a place where they're indistinct where it is you're not at the end of a road, but you are, you are, in, you are lost in a crowd where it's sort of very brown, you know, mm -hmm. and sort of there's no, you don't stand out in the crowd, you sort of blend into and can sort of disappear within it. Um, just a point, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think that's very true, so that, that there, there are lots of other people who look like them, who have right. similar experiences to them, that they can, they can share those with or not share them with if they so choose. And it won't necessarily cut across black and white. You might have, who knows. Yeah, I mean, that's the interesting thing is that their group of friends are incredibly diverse. And the questions that I might have asked at that age about kind of the family, it's not even on their radar. Right. They don't even know where their, their friends' families have come from, their, their countries of origin or anything like that. They're just their friends. Uh, you mentioned an author named Kwame, but I didn't get the last name. Apia. Please okay. spell that for me. A-P-P-I-A-H. I say that because yeah. as, as um, a reporter at The Root, um, our editor-in-chief, Henry Louis Gates, and Kwame Apia have, a very, have had a close working academic relationship on issues relating to race and culture. Um, and I know that Ralph and I had chatted about how he has read Apia. Um, yes, I, I, I read him a great deal. In, really had, was a great influence on my, on my thinking. And, and I, you know, he is a, he is a philosopher. So, you know, it's a very slow reading. I, I would highly recommend his book, Cosmopolitanism, which is probably his most accessible book, I think. Ralph? Yes. I'm curious about how uh, tempted you were to get deeply into your grandfather's thinking processes. It was a a question I had to answer when I was doing my own memoir, and I was wondering what you now think of him. Is he a hero to you? Is he a, a maverick? How do, how do you feel about uh, it? <clears throat> I'd say that he's, he's all of those things. He's a very com complex person. And so yeah, he's, he's kind of a, a hero, and there was some concern of people talking to me, thinking that I was trying to remake him into this racial pioneer when you know, people in that part of Alabama either really hold him in high esteem or really despise him for what he did. Um, so I see him more as someone who really wanted to live his, his life 
the way that, that he chose without anyone telling him how to live it. And that was, he wanted that freedom. And I think I, I admire that in him a great deal. I think I have a lot more admiration for him. Uh, and I think that, and I also have a sense of his, his brilliance and cutting. I tell people that when I learned about how he managed his bootlegging business and, and really moved things along, I'd say if he had been around today, he would have been running a hedge fund. So, uh, rather than a bootlegging business, uh, which brings its old, own set of problems, as we all know. Right. <laughs> in the back. Um, my grandfather was a lawyer in northern Alabama. Uh, and some of his clients were charged with felonious fornication. Did your grandparents ever come to the attention of the authorities? I'm no, they did not. There was a, a case around the same time that did come to trial. And um, it was Percy Reed and Helen Corkins. And they were, you know, Percy Reed was convicted, but eventually it was overturned. Um, but it did not come up. And I think it's, there are a couple of things that really protected them. I think it was their, you know, the status of the family. And the, the interesting thing about this whole case is that two of my grandfather's uncles testified on behalf of the state against Percy Reed to send him to jail, mm -hmm. uh, which I found really interesting. But this is something I did not know until I was um, doing this talk at the Museum of Mobile last week, is that I was also related to the Bassett family, who were the, they got a land grant from George III to settle in South Alabama, that one of the Bassetts was a judge in Alabama at the time. And that also, he said, well, it was probably the judge there who would have decided that same case that you read to us about that would have kept them from being prosecuted. Right. So it's all, and so it's all of the, the family connections as well that probably mm. shielded them from that. And just to recap, like Loving versus Virginia was it's, the case that the Supreme Court ruled in 67 that made um, – interracial marriage legal, but in Al it was Alabama that had still had the law in the books as late as 2000? Yes, it was as late as 2000. Right. So it was, there was actually a state referendum to change it in 2000. 2000. I can't remember. It was actually, wasn't, uh, it was fairly close. And it was a, there was a high turnout in right. the election. That was, the, <laughs> that was a, the thing I ended up also looking at in the archives. Well, what was voter turnout like that you're mm. thinking, well, maybe voter turnout was low. But it was in 2000, the voter turnout was high. Do you think that means that people are still conflicted about it? I mean, I know there are many things that are, if you look at, you know, Brown v. Board was in 1954, but people certainly weren't ready to desegregate then. It wasn't until the 60s and then, you know, the 70s and even today that we're seeing the struggle to work through those issues. Do you think, I don't know, I guess I just... I think, curious, yes. Yeah, what do you think about <clears throat> that case? Uh, I think that, yes, there are people who are still struggling with it. And, and when you start to, when I start to look at how that, that vote divided up along sectional lines. It wasn't as much of an issue in South Alabama as it was in the North and in the Black Belt. So it became, mm -hmm. so it was those d divides that were within regions of Alabama really did come into play and in how that vote worked out. That was, mm -hmm. that was the really interesting thing that I found in my research. Any other questions from folks? Take a few more. How are we doing on time? Hi. Um, I'm interested in, in whether or not you can kind of unpack what you think may have been the impact of your family's uh, social class uh, in terms of how they were treated as much as the, the racial issue. Uh, I'm struck by the fact that there was property involved. When you mentioned loving, I was going to mention them. That was a very, very uh, low-income couple from, the poor couple from Virginia. And um, how you can distinguish, you know what I mean? What would have been the story, for instance, if your grandmother had been, had been uh, poor or vice versa, uh, her white husband? Can I throw I, in a kink? And if the, yeah, the genders yeah. had been reversed? Uh, I think there are two things. If, if they had been poor, I think it would have been very different because that's the case with the Reed and Corkins case that I mentioned. They were a, a poor couple. If the genders had been reversed, 
there would not have been it a trial. It would have been a mess. <laughs> there, you know, there would have been just violence. There you know, would have been, probably would have been a lynching. Interesting. Uh, so, I, so I think that's... Lucky you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lucky me. So yes, does that answer your question? But I, th I think social class did play a role in how they navigated this because as I said, they've got this first family status in that part of Alabama, which protected them in a lot of ways, which gave them a very different social network than someone who would have been poor, who would not have had that really tightly knit social network. What, what I was saying then is the two of them were so integrated themselves, the race and the class. Now. Yes, I, I, would, I would agree that yes, those, those two really did shield them in a lot of ways, yes. Um, Ralph? This question comes partly from a, a book I've, uh, another book I read lately with this structurally similar, similar uh, interracial family, in this case, uh, I think from somewhere in Tennessee moving to St. Louis and so on. But I'm reflecting uh, both on what you've, your talk today and also on, on uh, Evers' long time. I don't have a sense of a lot of anger. And I'm, and I'm sort of surprised at that. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, is that, you know, you're telling the story or is that really, uh, 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 you know, is that is that did that isolation really work well enough that that wasn't part of the scene? I, well, I think the only time I really got angry during the course of working on this book was when I was with my my white relatives who were trying to tell me exactly how my family um, fit into this. We got into a discussion of you know my grandparents are buried in separate cemeteries; they could not be buried in the same cemetery. And I said, well, my grandfather was buried there in the white cemetery on the condition that he could be, that the family could visit him. And my cousin said, well, of course they could visit him. It's a public cemetery. I said, in, in 1956, it was not. Mm. And she, had, it, she could not even process that. Uh, it was very, so we really got into it that night about that whole issue, and I think that's where I was trying to to really meet them halfway, and that the whole issue of not really realizing my experiences and my family's experiences were very different from theirs because of the racial dividing line that had been cast there. But she couldn't comprehend that, and that that really made me that made me angry that night. And it was I had a difficult time; I couldn't mask my anger that night. I, I'd say that's so, there isn't any real bitterness I have about it, but were there times that I was angry in the course of this? Yes, there were. Was there, like, in, uh, among your parents and your grandparents, was that sort of a, an underlying, was there, why do I have to do this, why do I have to do that, I've got to protect you from, from you know, next to you, or your grandparents, your parents, I've got to protect you from this in the future? Um, you mean, my, just, Well, I think, I think kind of the way that the family just dealt with it is that we're going we're gonna to do whatever we want to anyway. So they, they, didn't get, they didn't get mad, they got even. Um, and that's what they did. They, they worked their way around it. Uh, and that's the interesting thing to me is that they always found a way around the law. Always. Your last answer just struck me about, I guess I'm curious if you know why your grandfather chose to be buried in a white cemetery. To be buried in a white cemetery, yeah. To be buried, mm -hmm. but sent his kids to the black school. And if you're aware of other sort of choices like that where he could, for lack of a better way, sort of take advantage of one versus the other. Well, he's, he was buried there. They wanted to bury him beside my grandmother, but his family would not hear of it. So there was, there was negotiation okay. going on. And at the time, it was my, my mother's decision. And she said, we've had him all these years. If they want him now, they can have him back. <laughs> so that's, so that's, why he's, that's why he's buried there. Maybe just one more. Well, let me just say thank you for speaking with us today.
Um, but I was also wondering, do you think the post-racial lens, lens is beneficial or detrimental for examining uh, personal family histories? Uh, it can be both, I think. It can be, um, it can be beneficial, but at the same time, it can, can keep us from seeing a lot of things. And I, I'm always hesitant to, to talk about things in, within a, a post-racial lens because that, that term implies that a conversation has really taken place when I think that that conversation is ongoing. So I see that as something that we are working toward rather than something we have achieved. So as much as I try to look at things through that lens, I also think about the, you know, that race is a social reality in our culture, mm -hmm. that I can't really move beyond it. So I, I try to look at it that way as much as possible, but I also keep myself very much rooted in um, the social reality of now. And then how do we have that conversation and get to the next point? That, that was one of my motivations for writing this book was to help uh, foster that conversation in some ways by just looking at one family and what they went through and saying, well, does this lead us to a, a discussion of a lot of other issues that we should be discussing in our culture? And that's, that's really my motivation for it. And I think that's, uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Right. Well, I think we've had a, we had a good conversation about okay. race. So your book has been <laughs> instrumental um, in starting that conversation and continuing it. I, I highly urge all of you to, to, to pick it up um, and read, you know, a, a detective story, but also a really, a really great um, novelistic almost treatment of, of this, uh, this three generations of a family. So thank you so much, Ralph. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you. I had a lot of fun.